Much better. Hemorrhagic shock from Pharisees, failed medical therapy. Suction stopped working. Because your canister is full. I'm on it. Oh my God. Can someone please take her out. Mom. Thank you very much. By the way, that is not how you raise patient satisfaction scores. Okay, Dr. McKay, do you want to explain to Javadi here all about the Minnesota? Yeah. So, best way to stop the bleeding is direct pressure. First balloon goes in the stomach as an anchor. Second runs the length of the esophagus for direct pressure on the varices. First, we want to inflate the balloon underwater like a bicycle inner tube to check for any air leaks. Javadi, stop cocking the porch. Is that the CC syringe? Suction's good and running. I got it. Okay. <laughs> so, it's like every episode is like the worst day in the department ever. <laughs> So, yeah. So what's going on here is that we have this patient who has bleeding esophageal varices. The veins that are in your esophagus can enlarge and can bleed. We see that often uh, in patients with a history of alcoholism. And those patients can come in with vomiting blood. So it, it can be a very dramatic and dangerous life-threatening presentation. And so in this case, they're trying to stop the bleeding. And the way that they're going to do that is by putting this balloon in the esophagus, inflating the balloon, and actually putting direct pressure on those bleeding veins. We absolutely do that, and that's one approach. They say at the beginning that the patient has failed medical therapy, so that means that they gave the patient a bunch of medications to try to stop the bleeding, but that wasn't enough. It apparently is still bleeding. But... Hey, God. Yeah, a great example of another one of those very terrifying moments, yeah. which is somebody vomiting a significant amount of blood. The, a few flags go off because one, you've got what they described here as hemorrhagic shock, which is that they're vomiting so much blood that their oh. blood pressure is now tanking because they don't have enough blood inside their blood vessels to maintain that pressure, which is just a sign that it, they have lost a significant amount of blood. In this case, if you know there's blood coming up, you probably know there's blood going down the GI tract that you can't see as well. And so you're not even quite sure exactly how much blood they've lost, which is a terrifying thought. But the other, I think, thought that's probably going through your mind in these circumstances is the airway, which is that if somebody's vomiting blood, you're, you're also really worried about their ability to protect their airway, to not aspirate for that blood to go into their lungs after it comes back up. And yeah, it's just, it's one of those, one of those kind of red flag moments. Some of our medical interventions that we have are really fancy and are like really technological. And every once in a while, it's just like a bike inner tube, like he <laughs> says, that we are gonna shove into someone's throat and inflate and try to stop the bleeding. That's right. And, and sometimes those things are extremely effective, but you know, you have these moments where you're like, wow, that's the best tech we have in this moment, huh? Yes. And you know what? It's an interesting point because we do that same technique like in many different parts of the body. So we have a balloon that we use to inflate to stop bleeding in the esophagus. If somebody has a heart attack and has a blockage in their artery, we put a, a balloon into their, their coronary artery to open it up. We have a balloon that we use in a Foley catheter, a urinary catheter, right, and we put right. that into the bladder to hold the catheter in place. A lot of times we're like blown up balloons in the body. Turns out it's a really useful technique. Langdon called the main line. You gotta be kidding me. Princess Answer told me you were busy, just wanted you to know. Okay, noted, thank you. You see anything? I don't have to. Just have to push the tongue out of the way in order to pass the tube. Okay, here we go. Heart rate's 124, BP's still only 84 over 42. The bleeding is still brisk. Get another unit on that infuser, please. How far did you go? 50 centimeters. Dr. Robbie? Did you say 50 centimeters? Yes, that's plenty. Inflate the gastric balloon, start with 50, and then we'll check the placement of the stomach with an x-ray. Yeah, that's like everybody's worst day. <laughs> That patient with the bloody airway and the upper GI bleed and they're like, yeah, that's 
not something that happens that often. Maybe in this hospital, in this patient population, you know, this particular disease of the esophageal varices is more prevalent, but yeah, that's a, a pretty impressive GI bleed presentation. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we, we do see fair number of GI bleeds. Yeah, yeah, overall, right. Which is bleeding from anywhere in your intestinal tract from your esophagus all the way through your small intestine and large intestine, they are rarely this dramatic. When they are this dramatic, it is terrifying. I was just thinking for a second about the, the, the patient population here. And we're talking about esophageal varices, which are these dilated veins in your esophagus, as you mentioned, which are typically a result of somebody having cirrhosis, which is most commonly caused by alcohol use over long periods of time, or some folks who have what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease through metabolic issues that they've kind of had throughout their life. You know, I'm, I'm laughing and saying this is a terrible day for these doctors. So the reason is a few issues. So one is that in somebody who is bleeding that much and, and vomiting blood, you see her face is covered in blood. So the blood loss is one problem that's life-threatening. Yeah. And then two, you have the fact that there's so much blood in her mouth that she's not able to protect her airway, as you were alluding to earlier. And what that means is you, you can't take a deep breath if your mouth is filled with blood. Mm -hmm. And so we just saw the scene where they're putting the tube into her GI tract, that balloon, but the breathing tube as well. And that's its own challenge because you have uh, somebody, their airways filled with blood, you're trying to place this tube through their vocal cords, but it's difficult to see because there's all of the blood there. And so that intubation by itself is very challenging. It's like trying to, driving in the rain almost, that you're trying to see this very tiny target and there's all this blood in your field of vision. And so it's just technically difficult to do. And then on top of that, the patient's lost a lot of blood. So you have this whole second issue even once the patient's intubated and that's what they're addressing here. Right, and I think we hear somebody at the bedside say heart rate still 124, blood pressure still 80 over something. Most folks would recognize those numbers as abnormal and bad. Right. We don't want to say <laughs> when blood pressure goes down, heart rate goes up. So those two things are connected because it's your way, your body's way of compensating. But, you know, m most folks will probably know normal blood, blood pressure. We want around 120 over 80. So this person has lost so much blood that they they're, you know, almost half of that, which is quite a dangerous setup.